Okay, uh, seems to be working now. Let me just quickly set up and uh, check to make sure that everything's uh, working fine over here. Seems like it, yes. And yeah, that one is dialed down just a little bit. So it doesn't, um, okay, well that's for audio dial. That doesn't really make a difference. Okay, so uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is my uh, review of Bethel Church. Matter of fact, I'm just gonna be looking at one sermon, just like my last Reformation and uh, Fertig videos. Simply because, yeah, that is the best way to do this, I decided. So, yeah, we're going to be jumping into one of Bill Johnson's most recent sermons on Holy Spirit and Unity. And let's see what he has to say about that. Uh, I'm probably not going to be agreeing with a lot of what he's saying. Uh, let me just do something here real quickly. Uh, my streaming needs to be about 1,500, yeah shouldn't be that high really shouldn't be that high at all because otherwise it uh, lags at quite a distance away from the router and uh, if it lags you guys are probably gonna get annoyed and I get annoyed as well so uh, let's let's make sure it doesn't lag so I'm just gonna be doing like a general health check of my recording before we get busy with the sermon review uh, I think I can open it so long and Put my headphones on. Uh, it's about an hour long, but like uh, with the Fertig video, we're not going to be, uh, you know, reviewing the whole thing. I just don't think that it's um, necessary to do that. So it seems like my stream is fine. Oh, hello. Okay, you just hang on for a second, Bill Johnson. Be with you in a moment. Okay, let's shift over to this one, and there we got our infinite scream, uh, screen, screen, scream, infinite scream. Good heavens, that that's disturbing. Okay, so Johnson, his face, it's far less disturbing. Uh, let's just bring the size down a little bit. And yeah, let's, now suddenly I'm back to no data over here. Why? Okay, no, no problem. Uh, let's, let's not look at myself now. No, no infinite screens. Okay, so let me just cover up that logo just a little bit. And how does it look? Looks okay, so we can just stretch this out a little bit, and that should be great. I have to wait for like five or ten minutes until the end of the live stream. All right, so let's just keep on going. And hope. The promises of God give us hope, gives us a sense of a future. It doesn't mean we have challenges, and we've got so many of them right now uh, as a nation and nations of the world. It's not just the U.S. Right. Um, but nations of the world are facing so many huge challenges but it's overwhelming if I face them without the promises of God, if I face them without the sense of hope that Jesus actually has a plan. He right. actually has a solution. And uh, it's maintaining my heart, feeding on that solution. It just keeps me not only alive, it keeps me sane, or at least as sane as I'm ever gonna get. Hmm. And uh, so we, we really celebrate the fact that Jesus has a purpose and a plan. Uh, something I've stated uh, many times in the last 12 months is that every problem that exists on planet Earth, and I mean uh, balancing your checkbook at home to the ozone layer to the racial conflicts or whatever it might be, every single problem that exists on the planet, God has a solution. In Okay, uh, somehow I feel like I should be taking notes. Uh, yeah, sure, let's, whatever, let's let's do notepad. Can't beat the classics, am I right? Okay, uh, let's just make it like this and make it big, make it nice and big. Okay, so no problem without God having a solution. Okay, that's yeah, uh, right. So we have some, like a big pointer so far. No problem without God having a solution. Okay, let's keep going. In his mind at this very moment, and he simply looks for his people on earth. And I mean, uh, balancing your checkbook at home to the ozone layer, to the racial conflicts, or whatever it might be. Every single problem that exists 
on the planet. God has a solution in his mind at this very moment. Having a solution in his mind? Right. Uh, uh, still probably still busy with the first point, so let's go on. And he simply looks for his people to come to him and pursue those mysteries, those secrets. And uh, some things are revealed very quite... Mm, okay, so what I'm hearing is like we... My mic's in the way, let's just do it like this. We need to pursue his secrets. Quite clearly in scripture, some things uh, uh, we really have to press into. But uh, I remind you of the scripture, Psalms, excuse me, Proverbs 25, verse 2. Uh, okay, Proverbs. Okay, so exhibit A. Or what, what can we use for that? I'm wasting time. Proverbs 25. Verse 2. Now, another installment of Let's Read It in Context. Um, Proverbs 25. More Proverbs of Solomon. And I'm going to use the NIV Critica, uh, uh, Credit to Biblica. The Inc. Copyright. There we go. Used by permission. All rights reserved worldwide. So, credit to them. Don't sue me, bro. Thank you. These are the pro these are more prophets of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. So actually let's take a note about this. Can I change this to a different color? Oh boy, that's me getting off topic. Page setup. What what can we do? Letter yeah, okay, this 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 is this is irrelevant. Proverbs 2 verse 4. Is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter, is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. So the hearts of kings remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a vessel. Remove wicked officials from king's presence, and his throne will be established through righteousness. And I have a dark mode for the site, so I'm going to turn that on. Great. That that looks better. Uh, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence and do not claim a place among his great men. It is better for him to say to you, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. What you have seen with your eyes, do not bring, or nobles, or whom yet set your eyes hastily to court. What will you do in the end if your neighbor puts you the same? If you will take your neighbor to court, do not betray another's confidence, or the one who hears it may shame you and the charge against you will stand. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a ruling rightly given. Like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge to a listening ear. So, Like a snow cool drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. Like clouds and a wind without rain is the one who boasts of gifts never given. Now these words are like honey to my soul. I mean I love reading proverbs. They, they just Absolutely amazing. Uh, but let's let's see what Bill Johnson is trying to say about this. That, um, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. So he hides things, not from us, but for us. It's the glory. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the hearts of kings are unsearchable. To conceal a matter. Okay. The context of this is not exactly given, and this is a proverb, so it's not exactly something that you should be taking to its most literal extreme. To conceal a matter probably means to, you know, be discreet in your handling of a matter. It doesn't exactly mean that there are mysteries out there. Like, God's, God does keep some things from us. So, so far, what he's saying is not extremely off biblical, but it sounds like it's getting to some kind of, I don't know, Gnostic type vibe. God to uh, conceal a matter. And uh, then it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. So your royalty, my royalty in a very real sense is demonstrated, royalty because who our father is. Royalty is demonstrated by this privilege to seek God for soul. Royalty is 
Look, man, he's uh, just said like three sentences and he's already lost me. Let's just go back a little bit. But uh, I remind you of the scripture, Psalms, to uh, conceal a matter. And uh, then it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. So your royalty, my royalty, in a very real sense, is demonstrated. Royalty because who our father is. It feels like there was like, I don't know, 12 steps. He kind of just step, skipped past from one thought to the other. I mean, uh, yeah. This is, now it's vertical all over again. God conceals matters. Royalty of who God is, is... Um, okay, <laughs> let's just go back. Oh, there we go. Royalty of who God is, is... Royalty is demonstrated by this privilege to seek God for solutions. And now is the time where, where we really, really need that again and again. I would have said that last week and the week before, but boy, it's just heightened the awareness of our need of God's intervention is just getting uh, more critical week by week. I wrote something this week I wanted to read. God's intervention is increasingly needed. I take it that's what he means by critical. As I start, then I'm going to move quickly into the uh, subject of Pentecost, because that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what today is, is we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. He said it as of uh, Pentecost Sunday stole his car. <laughs> but yeah, all right, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, let's, let's keep going. Um, Racism is evil. It is demonic yeah, to its sure. core. To treat people with dishonor because of their skin color is absolute foolishness. To turn that dishonor into violence is barbaric and inhuman. Absolutely. In Christ, we have the privilege and responsibility to oppose racism in all its forms and to stand with those who have suffered under its weight. Yeah, I want to start by just declaring <clears throat> our absolute commitment to protect those <clears throat> and to stand on behalf of those who are um, abused or uh, rejected or judged in some manner, or in some cases violence, as we've seen this last week, is just crazy. And uh, so we as a church are just doing all we know to do to take a very strong stand to say, listen, this, this foolishness has to stop. And uh, so we're, we're going to do our part. We're standing with uh, people and really fighting on behalf of those. I love one of the phrases in the song uh, today that we sang. It says, marching on our knees. My goodness, what a great picture. Knees, uh, being on our knees is a place of prayer. It's a place of deep intercession. And that's the place where great advancement comes. So I'm going to be talking about the concept of Pentecost and how it happened, how it came about. So, I don't see the link between the two of them. Like, I mean, I guess he's going to draw a parallel between speaking in tongues towards reaching out to different cultures, but I mean, I don't get the parallel between... Okay, so he was probably just saying, well, racism is bad, and then he's going to go on with his sermon. But if he's trying to connect the two, I don't see the connection. If you would, open your Bible. I mean, it, it's against the character of of God to judge one race uh, above another however um, I don't I don't get exactly how uh, his logic works and why do I have an old motherboard as an app recommended to me by Google Ads they do not know me at all I don't want an old motherboard really guys come on and we'll go right to Acts chapter 1 and I want to talk to you out of this uh, this amazing <clears throat> chapter Hallmark of the NAR, an, a, a fixation on the book of Acts. Now, the book of Acts is part of the Bible. It's just important as the rest of the Bible. But the NAR takes it to this extreme, extreme, if I may put it that way. I wanted to use a different word. This, They take it to an extreme uh, because they really only focus on the book of Acts. So let's just go to the books, book of Acts, chapter 1. 
and actually read it a little bit in context. I already have a video where I did so, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. And I recommend you guys read it in context for yourselves. Please be good shepherds, be, be Bereans. Acts chapter 1, be Bereans and look this up. Whatever I say, whatever Bull Johnson says, go and read it up in the book of the in, in the book itself, in the Bible itself, in order to test us. Sorry, I'm a little tired. It's 10 o'clock at night here where I am which is usually my bedtime, so if I seem a little confused, that's why. Many people think that Jesus' final words to the church was, go into all the world, preach the gospel, disciple nations. Wasn't it, remember I'm with you always? Uh, but you will be okay now. That's that's uh, I was wrong, and I and I read this book a while back. So it's always always great to refresh your memory about the Bible because I mean you can easily forget a lot of stuff, and then somebody else can come in and twist it. Um, f do not leave while he was eating with him. I wrote that Jesus began to do. Not at the time, guys. But it's not you to know that uh, said it by his own authority. It is not n not for you to know the times or dates the Father set by his own authority. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will by witness and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he said this, he was taken up before the very eyes, and a cloud hid them from the hid him from their sight. So he was talking to the apostles. The apostles, not not us. The apostles let's make that very clear so he's probably going to segue into it because uh, the NIR believes the apostles are still around today and we just have much authority of those guys and blah de blah de blah uh, so that's probably what he's going to do now it wasn't his last words his last words were wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the father Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said to them, okay, so they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It is not for you to know the times or dates the father set by his own authority. So strictly speaking, that was in his last words to them. They asked him a question and he answered them and he said, um... You will be witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So, wait in Jerusalem until you're clothed with power from on high. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days we will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Clothed with power. It's quite a bit of a big pair of phrase, don't you think? The go is essential. The wait prepares us for the going. And the whole point... This is another one of like A minus B equals 10,000 ducks in a row. I don't know how he gets from one to the other. The go prepares us and the wait... The go and the wait, the wait prepares us for the go. Of the waiting is, there is something more than what you've seen to this point. There's because there is more where that came from. Something more that God has in store for you. Imagine yourself one of the 11 remaining disciples and Jesus appears to them. One of the moments he appeared to them is in John 20 where they were hiding in a room. 
Okay, let's 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 go and look that up. John twenty, because you know we need to be. I'm I'm already skeptical as it is. We really had like a big paraphrase. We refer to the Holy Spirit as power when the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He has power, sure, but I mean, it's a bit of holy simplification. Acts chapter twenty. Thinking they were going to be killed next, if you can imagine the hostility of the hour, they are literally. Okay. Jesus appears to his disciples. When the disciples were together, peace be with you. For fear the and he said, Peace be with you. Okay, so Jesus appears to his disciples. This is after he rose from the dead, after he had been crucified. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene. Uh you can read this. once again, do do your own reading. Read the this chapter on your own. However, uh it's on the evening of the first day of the week, this is in verse 9 of John 20, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. All right? Afraid for the money, where they were hiding in a room, thinking they were going to be killed next. If you can imagine the hostility of the hour, they are literally afraid for their lives as they hide out in this room. Jesus always knows where we are, and so he just appeared, walking through the wall, however he got there. They were, that didn't help the fear issue at all when uh, somebody just appears. And they didn't know it was Jesus, so you gotta keep that in mind. Jesus just appears in this room. Hmm, okay. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, they showed them his hands, the disciples, when they saw the Lord. Okay, I, I guess I guess they didn't recognize him at first. Yeah, they show him the, his hands. So, so like, but yeah, okay, cool. They, their fear just got com compounded, and they are terrified. And Jesus says, "Peace to you." That didn't help because they were they're in way too much fear to receive any kind of peace. It's not what the Bible says, but. Um, will that be, that's not what the Bible says, but okay, sure. And so Jesus showed him the scars in his hands, his side, his feet. When they saw that, they recognized this is Jesus. We saw him crucified. As soon as they realized that, they, they began to experience the peace that Jesus promised. And he said again to them, again to you, I say, peace to you. This is important to realize. In this moment, of ab sometimes we're so filled with fear and terror that, that we can't find peace, and yet it's, it's here. It's here. There has to be a turning. And what happened in the hearts of the disciples, there was a turning. They recognized, oh, it's Jesus. He is with us. And when he spoke peace the second time, he breathed on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they received true peace. Yeah, he's reading a lot of stuff into just a simple verse. Like, I mean, illustrating, dramatic, dramatizing it. I mean, he's making a lot of inferences about the scripture. All right, it doesn't bode well right. at all. Here's, here's the deal. Jesus gave them in that decree, go into all the world, preach the gospel. He gave them a commission. What else did he give them in the commission? Our response, our yes to the commission of God, is what connects us to the authority of God. They were given. Okay, um, peace be with you. They said, do not all for not going to. Okay, I don't know where he's getting that deep from. Is there a verse I missed somewhere? Authority gave them in that 
decree upon them. In the hearts of the disciples, there was a turning. They recognized, oh, it's Jesus. He is with us. And when he spoke peace the second time, he breathed on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they received true peace. All right, here's, here's the deal. Jesus gave them in that decree, go into all the world, preach the gospel. He gave them a commission. What? Okay, let's let's look up uh, the verse of the Great Commission. Uh, I think Luke would be the one who got the Great Commission. Let's go to Matthew. Yeah. Said in the mountain, when I saw all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Was well, some of the what goes soldiers? Surely I am with you always. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. With the gallery to the mountain, when they saw that the worship him, all authority has been given to me, therefore go and teaching them to obey everything, and surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so let's go and look at another one of the Gospels. In order, Great Commission, Luke. Let's go look at the book of Luke. Maybe there's some other details over here. Uh, Acts 1, verse 4 to 8. So we're going to go back to Acts 1 now. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them, Do not leave, but wait for the gift, but then you will be baptized. Lord, are you going? It's not for you new, but you receive power, and you will witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay. Um, I said, these are the words I spoke to you. You are witnesses of these things. Repentance. Lord, I've seen the promise of you, but send them to your clothes. And he laid them out. And when he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem. But say until you clothed with power from on high. Until you clothed with power from on high. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Okay, so it's actually not in uh, Acts chapter 1 which he's referring to. It's in Luke 24, verse 49. Um... There it talks about being clothed with power. So, all right. So that, what he said actually did come from the Bible. It's just always be helpful with these NAR guys to make sure that they actually are talking in the Bible. Uh, but none of us is, uh, you, you need to agree with it. The Great Commission and, I don't know, it's Mark 16 verse 14 to 18. Mark 16 verse 14 to 18 let's quickly look that up in iv all credit peter the 11 as they were eating and rebuked them for the lack of the face to be those he said go into all the world and preach the gospel or whosoever believes and is baptized will be saved but whoever does not believe will be condemned these signs will accompany those who believe in my name they will drive out demons they will speak in new tongues they will pick up snakes with their hands and when they drink deadly poison and will not hurt them at all place their hands on sick people and they will get well and I'll get why he was taken up to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord walked with them, confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. Sure. Okay, well, there's quite a few couple uh, different uh, great commission, like different perspectives of the disciples. So, yeah, but none of it is like you, what he's saying he here. Give Jesus gave them in that decree. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. He gave them a commission. What uh -huh. else did he give them in the commission? Our response, our yes to the commission of God, is what connects us to the authority of God. They were given authority in that moment. But then okay. he said, wait in Jerusalem. Why? Because we need both authority and power. That is how... Let me just make sure of this when he said... Yeah. Jesus ministered. It's how the disciples ministered when they were deputized under Jesus's anointing. They were deputized. If you remember in Luke 9, Jesus gave his disciples power and authority. He gave them both to function in while he was on the earth. But when he left and went to the right hand of the Father, they had to 
Okay, that's a bit of visual, but anyway, uh, let's let's just um, go to Luke chapter nine. I don't believe uh, uh, give you power and authority is biblical, but we just, as I said, we need to make sure of it. Not the ESV. Uh, we want the NIV. Where is it? New International Version. There we go. So this is up. Sent. They sent them out, gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Yeah, so that, that is true. Find once again this place of authority and this place of power because now they were going to do it without Jesus being at their side. I remind you of something that I think is, is so critical, so important. One of the comments that Jesus made to his disciples that I'm sure was about the most difficult thing to comprehend they've ever heard him say. He said, it is better for you that I go. That I'm sure, I remind you of something that I think is, is so critical, so important. <clears throat> One of the comments that Jesus made to his disciples that I'm sure was about the most difficult thing okay, uh... to comprehend they've ever heard him say. He said, it is better for you that I go. Now imagine that. They've spent three and a half years with Jesus. They can ask him anything. They are constantly impacted by his actions, his words. They learn from his behavior. Everything is an overwhelming three and a half year school of discipleship. And in this moment of of absolute adoration. They want to sit at his right hand, at his left. They want to be there as he takes a dominion over the kingdoms of the world. And they're all positioning themselves to be a support to this Messiah. And then he says, it's better that I go. I can't imagine any... Okay, so this is biblical. What is very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. All right. We can read that in context. See what the context is. So I was grieved for turning to joy. Will not uh, that will all this belongs in a little while. Will see me no more, and then after a while you will see me. And after a while, okay. You're asking. Told you this thing, so that in the world you have trouble. Take God, I have overcome the world. All right. Hearing anything in their position that would be more opposite of what they would normally feel. He said, it's better that I go, because if I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. Here's the deal. Picture this. You're one of the 11. Jesus is at your side. At any moment, you can reach out and touch him. You can ask him a question. You can receive instruction. He is there just guiding you with his eyes even, the way he does life. There's a constant lesson of what it is to know God, to follow God. He's right here. And yet that one who is right here said, it's going to be better if I go because I'll send the Holy Spirit. So here's the challenge. There's very few that I go. Retriever, it is for your own good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove to the world to be wrong and sin. So, all right. Challenge. Is your relationship with the Holy Spirit better than if Jesus were standing at your side? If it's not better, then we're not utilizing what God actually provided for us by giving us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that rests upon us. This is what we were assigned to prepare better than if Jesus were standing at your side. If it's not better, then we're not utilizing what God actually provided for us by giving us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit that rests upon us. This is what we were assigned to. Mm. We were assigned to this. The gospel of the kingdom of God, Paul says, is not in word only. It is in power. 
there must be the demonstration of power. Power in our personal life to overcome a sin, temptation, those kinds of issues. But it's power for the miraculous. It's power to confront the impossibilities of life. This is what we are assigned to live in, to walk. And he gave power to the apostles, yeah. Um, look, I'm not, I'm not a cessationist. I do still believe in the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. However, I'm very skeptical of those who say you have to have these gifts of the Holy Spirit in order to be a Christian or you need to. Walk in is to walk in the absolute power of God to demonstrate the resurrection of Jesus. Every time you and I pray for someone and there's a miracle, it's a demonstration that the resurrection of Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. If I pray for you and you experience a miracle, you've just seen what God can do. If I pray for you and nothing happens, you've just seen what I can do. It's the absolute... Okay, well, look, this is one of these things that I don't agree with because uh, sometimes it's just not God's will for you to have that breakthrough because, I mean, God has a much larger plan for all of us. And, I mean, he can't just, like, I mean, jump on a worm and just heal us. So, I mean, <laughs> that's... Clothing continue. with power that makes it possible for us to demonstrate the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we get to Acts chapter 1... We see twice in the first few verses him talking about the kingdom of God. All of you parents know that when you, mm -hmm. you're about to leave the house and your, your kids are in the house, you have final words of instruction. Maybe they are staying with their grandparents. Maybe they're staying with uh, a babysitter. But you have final words of instruction. The final words are your most important words. That's what they, you want them to remember before you leave for the evening or for for a week, whatever it might be. Jesus' final words to his disciples was instruction in the context of wait, was instruction about the kingdom of God. It says in verse three, the last part, he says, he spent 40 days speaking to them of things pertaining the kingdom of God. The very next words out of his mouth, um, excuse me, the very next thing out of his mouth is he says, John baptized with water, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the disciples then say, hey, I got a question. When are you going to restore the kingdom? Uh, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times, but, excuse me, but you shall receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. What's the point I want to make? Twice in chapter one is the conversation about the kingdom of God. Once it was in his instruction. Second time, it was their question. When are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Both times, the very first subject he turns to after talking about the kingdom of God was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'd just like to suggest, use this as kind of a springboard. I'd just like to suggest... Yeah. It's a whole lot of making a very simple verse pretty complicated. That the introduction to the realities of the kingdom of God is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It immerses us into a reality. And this is available for everyone. This is not has and has not. I, I, I don't like that, that, that whole argument, that whole concept. This is available available for everyone who confesses Christ, that the Spirit of God would come upon us. He'll manifest differently. But the point is, Jesus is represented well. That's what we're looking for, that Jesus is represented accurately for who he really is. I feel like even if I took notes, it still wouldn't make sense because, I mean, look at these notes I have now. I mean, it's all over the place. I want you to move fast forward now <clears throat> to verse 14. Verse 14 says, <clears throat> these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Now, this is an interesting verse. We know from the rest of the chapter, there's around 120 people. So let's just say 120 people, which is interesting to me because Jesus elsewhere in Scripture says, after his death, he appeared to over 500 people. 
but there was only 120 in the prayer meeting. I don't know where the 380 went. I'm sure they got it later. I just don't want to miss when he shows up. I don't want to miss. So here they are. It says they continued in one accord in prayer. It's established that the prayer uh, out of unity had been taking place in this chapter. This is extremely significant. Look who attended the meeting. Of course, we have here Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, some of the women that were supporters, and his brothers. Why is that important? Because one of the last times we read about his brothers, they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And they tried to trick him into going into a public place to receive ridicule and opposition. So something has happened during this journey where they've come to the realization they've spent all this time growing up with the Son of God in the house. Imagine that realization. You've also got the 11 uh, disciples who spent their time, three and a half years, succeeded in ministry for sure, but they were also caught comparing themselves with one another, thinking they are better than the other, arguing as to who was the greatest. So we've got this accumulation of 120 people who have many issues throughout their life together. And yet this 10 days of prayer I don't know if they settled the issues before, the, before they started the 10-day prayer meeting or if they got ironed out in the prayer meeting. Do you remember when G Peter denied Jesus and Jesus shows up afterwards and he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? I think he was asking, Peter, do you love me more than the other remaining 10? Do you, do you, do you, do you really think you love me more than everybody else? Because there was this, this arrogance, this superiority, this, this thing that rose up in him to think everybody else is going to blow up, but not me. I'm, I'm the most secure one here. And Jesus confronted that in him, and it was in that repentance that he was fully restored. So let's get back to the story here. They continued in one accord in prayer. My translation adds the word and supplication. Let me talk to you for just a moment about the issue of prayer. Our prayer life reveals how conscious we are of the God who is with us. Okay, sure, I guess uh, you could make that argument. You can't have someone as glorious and significant as the Spirit of God resting upon a person and have that person not talk to him. The depth of our prayer life reveals the level of awareness we have to the Spirit of God in our lives. I'm not talking theologically. All of us as believers can say, we know that the Holy Spirit lives in us. We know that the Holy Spirit walks with us. He guides us. He teaches. I get that. I know that. I'm talking about the daily ongoing consciousness of the Holy Spirit of God. David said in the Old Testament, he said, I daily set the Lord before me. It's not that we can position God where we want. He's, he's, he's not under our command. We are under his. But David was saying, he's everywhere, so I turn my attention to God being with me. And that consciousness of God in his life is what in many ways enabled him to be the greatest king Israel ever had. So let's get back to the subject. It's a lot of skipping around. The second thing I want to challenge you in, for most people, our prayer life are times where we're pursuing comfort, pursuing peace, uh, the pleasure of the Lord. Now, comfort, pleasure. Let's just take those two words. Oh, my word, dude. You're going off on so many tangents. I swear you're doing trigonometry or something. Those are biblical concepts. God is the one who designed pleasure. He is the one who designed comfort. He is the one who, who made us to be able to rest in him. I'm accepted in the beloved. He delights in me. I'm his treasure. I'm the apple of his eye. All those things are absolutely 100% true. All right. But what happens when we distort our pursuit of comfort, we sacrifice having a lifestyle of impacting prayer. Okay, so I, I guess what he means by impacting prayer is, uh, well, like in the Bible talks about if 
well, a faith that can move mountains. I'm not sure if that's exactly yeah, what it's. I think it says that in the Bible, like he says, you if you have even as much grain as a mud, uh, faith, if you have even as much faith as a grain of mud, as if you have faith as big as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move into the ocean. So that's where faith could, that can move mountains. That is in the Bible, but. What he probably means is that every prayer you have, it needs to have some kind of impact or you're not doing it right. Uh, and some of you are saying, well, that's not what he's saying. The thing is with these NAR guys is that's kind of what they believe. It's well, not kind of, it is what they believe, that you have to change God's mind and that uh, we're the apostles and we have to make everything move. But, you know, God has his own will and if we pray for something, sometimes it's just not his will to, yes, shut up, I know you need to be charged. Sometimes it's not just just not his will for it to happen. So, I just wanted to go off on that ch tangent as well. There are prayers of fellowship with Lord, which is re refreshing, reassuring, building hope, building faith. But the Apostle Paul taught at one point about prayer being likened unto giving birth. He actually said, and I, I'm in labor for you until Christ is formed in you. And he was, uh, the context there was prayer. So think about this. This is an awkward uh, subject, but it's, it's, it's the intensity of prayer. And for those who only pursue a relationship with God of mm -hmm. comfort and pleasure will never know the kind of prayer that moves mountains. You have to be able to feel bored. The pain of a situation. As parents, we know what that is, to be in a, 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 a painful situation with our children. But well, I mean, just... You don't even have to be a parent in order to be able to sympathize with painful situations like looking at somebody or a friend of yours who's screwing up their life miserably or, uh, you know, being in pain for somebody you know or in your family who's also messing up their life or something like that. I mean, you don't just need to be a parent, but it's it's stronger if you are a parent that desire, like if your child's screwing up their life, then I mean, your, your pain as a parent is going to be a lot stronger than it would be for a friend, for example. Uh, because I mean they're your child and the love of a parent and a child is very different um, so yeah that's what he's saying yeah it is true because I mean this is directly from the Bible the thing is just there, there is a lot to go off because I mean there's a lot beneath the surface that he's saying that's not true either that's taking assumptions so let's just go a little bit further and then I'm gonna Kept us Here's the vital thing, is we come before the Lord and we pray unto, until it is lifted, until there is that sense of breakthrough. I remember my... Okay, actually, you know what? I think that's enough for the night because, I mean, I, as you guys can see, I am pretty tired. Uh, I think maybe what we can do is we can continue this soon, maybe tomorrow night. And then uh, I hope this is still doing a live stream. Yeah, it's... Fine, YouTube is not okay or whatever. Um, I hope this this was at least a little bit enlightening. Um, okay, so these notes don't make any sense. Um, let's switch over to my face cam. There we go. Okay, um, so a lot of what he's saying is biblical. A lot of what he's saying is also not biblical because I know via context what he actually believes in and uh, there's... He also said at one point that having a, that being in health is part of the gospel. It's every bit as part of the gospel as repentance of sins, which is not true. And, um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of stuff, NIR-related stuff that we still have to get to. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Because, I mean, a lot of the NIR, because, I mean, it does come from the gospel. Uh, it's just, it's an extreme that's not actually true. That a lot of... And the gospel is preached in our circles. I mean, a lot of people do get saved in these circles because, I mean, it is when Jesus is preached and there's genuine conviction of the Holy Spirit, we should rejoice for that. It does not mean that, however, that we should just be okay with whatever falsehoods are being preached. 
uh, thing is there's there's not a lot of um falsehoods in this video so far so i'm gonna have to finish it at some point um let's just look, talk a little bit about his preaching style uh, bill johnson comes off as a lot more um i don't know easier to get along with than stephen Furtick. he seems a lot friendlier a lot warmer and he even speaks in a much warmer way than stephen Furtick may stephen Furtick annoys the hell out of me uh bill johnson on the other hand I'm more irritated because of uh, the extremes he goes to when preaching out of the word and the fact that he, he rambles around. And I mean, it's not like I'm any stranger to that, but it feels like he rambles around and it kind of masks what he's really trying to preach. I mean, because they say something that's all controversial and they say, get me right. And then they kind of preach around it and they come back to it. They say, get me right. It's like they're doing this this complete dance around what they actually believe in and it's completely frustrating why don't you just come out and say it i mean uh, why do you have to do this long dance around it and say oh, well i know it's controversial and then they say something very minor and you're like okay, well that's not really controversial at all and then they get to something much more controversial you know the sales technique say what yes to one thing and then you say yes to the next thing so the structure of how we're breaking things down step by step and analyze it against the word of God is essential. You pretty much have to do that with a sermon. Like, don't just sit in there and take everything in at once. If you hear one truth, then just, you know, take in everything else. And if you hear one falsehood, you say, okay, well, just dismiss that in favor of the truth. So, I mean, you need to have a skeptical and critical mind when it comes to these things. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please remember to leave a like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys again next time with another video right here on KBRX. And I would like to thank my two Patreons as well, Jennifer and... Um, Jennifer um, and... Ashley? Is it Ashley? I think so. Uh, my two Patreons, you know what your names are. Thank you so much to them as well uh, before I go. And uh, yeah... Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll see you again with another video right here on KBRX.